All right, now something different. I don't want you to turn there, but before we read Matthew chapter 3, we're also going to read Malachi 4, and I'll go straight to Matthew 3. Malachi chapter 4, the prophet writes this, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts, remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and the rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And then Matthew 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore garments of camel's hair and a leather belt for, around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. And then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, and he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus is, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he consented, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Let us pray. Father God, your voice spoke from the sky. Your voice pronounced announcement on Jesus, your Son, with your pleasure in him, I pray that you would send your spirit down now. If any are here that have not come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, I pray that the spirit would open their hearts, that they may see their sins against you and may see the salvation offered through Jesus and his work on the cross. I would pray that you would speak to us this morning. If there be any darkness in this room, remove it and let there only be light. We pray this in Jesus' heavenly name, and all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. There's a pastor that talks about a church he had been pastoring for about six months. And he had this, this one lady, and she was, she was so faithful. She was in the midst of everything. They had Awanas, she was at Awanas. She, she had, if they had a mission project, she was in the middle of the mission project. She would, was one of the, the helpers, the leaders of every project they had. 
at the end of church, she would stay late and make everything sure things were cleaned up. She would make sure the lights were off and the doors. And, and she was just, in his mind, a wonderful Christian woman. However, he was going over the church rolls one day, and he went to the clerk and said, Our church rolls are wrong. I do not see so-and-so's name. And the church clerk said, No, our church rolls are not wrong. So-and-so is not a member of our church. And he said, What? How can that be? And she goes, Well, Pastor, the problem is, is she's never been baptized. Be a member of the church, you must be baptized and follow in as Jesus was baptized and as he commanded being baptized. And he looked at his clerk and said, How is it that she she has not been baptized. How could that be? She said, well, you see, every Friday she goes and she gets her big bouffant hairdo done. And on Sunday morning, she spends, by her own admission, at least an hour on all her makeup and everything to prepare for church. And quite honestly, to be baptized, she says, would just, she would be a mess. And he looked at her and said, of course she'd be a mess. That is what baptism is about. To be baptized is to come. To acknowledge not just before God, but before all the people in the church, that I am a sinner. That I have fallen far from the righteousness of God. That, that I am in the filth of sin, not because of anything anybody else has done, but because of everything that I have done. And, and just the, the act of baptism, to be washed clean, ultimately, we need to recognize first and foremost that baptism does not save us. Baptism, baptism, is but an illustration of the salvation that we have received. For, for there comes a time in our life when the Spirit opens our hearts, and, and as we pray for every unbeliever, that, that opens our hearts that we would recognize our sin against God, against the God Most High, the Creator of the universe, the One who's given us everything, who has supplied all things, including our own life. Every ability we have. You have the ability to make money. God has given that to you. you. You have great strength and are able to do great feats of strength. Guess who gave that to you? And guess who could take any of those gifts away, whatever they may be? It would be God. And that God we have sinned against. That God we have, we have turned our backs on and chosen, whether you recognize it or not, to treat ourselves as God. I want you to recognize in our scripture today, in Matthew, it starts out with John the Baptist, cousin to Jesus. Uh, some, of the, some of the Gospels call him John the Baptizer. Is not his faith. He wasn't a Southern Baptist or anything, but it is what he did. He comes preaching in the wilderness. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance is we need to recognize is more than saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is more than feeling bad. I used to tell the youth, I'd say, all right, I walk up to John. I smack him across the face as hard as I can. Somehow, the Spirit touches John, and he does not react to it, and he just looks at me like a maniac. And I step back and I say, I'm so sorry. I'm really sorry. Well, the Spirit's still on him, and he says, That's okay, Dad. And then, as soon as he says that, I immediately take my other hand and whack him across the other cheek as hard as I can. How sorry, I would ask the youth group, do you think I really was? Was I really sorry the first time? John would tell me, No. <laughs> Well, because you weren't in youth group at that time. That's why you don't remember that story. <laughs> John would say, and I think most of us would say, 
No, you weren't sorry. You just didn't want me to hit you. There is part of that. If I walk into a room and say, who in here wants to go to hell? Who wants the hellfire, the wrath of God on you for all eternity? I do believe, for the most part, nobody in here is going to raise their hand. If you're that person, please see me after the service. But none of us are going to go, yay, that's what I want. Repentance is more than saying, I don't want to be punished. We've all been there. Our parents at one time or another caught us doing something. None of us said, oh, I can't wait till they come punish me for this. My dad had a big two-by-four he had sawed a, a board out of, and, and just to make sure we could hear it coming, he drilled holes in it so it would whistle as it came through the air. We only ever had to have it used on us once, me and my brother. Usually my mom would take it out, we would go into hiding. But the point, the point is, none of us say, I look forward to punishment. None of us look forward to going to hell. Repentance is more than saying, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want punishment. In the original language, repentance actually means a change of mind. But it's even more than a change of mind. It's a change of mind that brings a change in behavior. Notice part of Claudia's testimony this morning. She spoke of, and we talked about this the other night, Claudia and I, there was a time when she hated this person so much, she couldn't picture it, she wouldn't talk to her husband about this person, he'd try to bring it up. No. As a matter of fact, if she had met her on the street, this person probably wouldn't have survived. She hated this person that much. Bringing a picture of the person into her head would bring anger. But there's a difference in her life now, since Jesus has come into her life. And she spoke a little about it during the baptism. That there's a feeling of peace. There's a feeling of God. That, that God is the ultimate judge. That, that God will judge it, either on the cross, if this person should, should come to Christ, or an eternity in hell. That she needs not worry about that at all. She's come to a new love of the Scriptures. She's been reading her Bible because she wants to know what God has to say. These are, are, are the things that, that repentance brings. We come to have maybe not a hate, but a disregard for God to a newfound love for Him. For we see a love so great and so grand that God would send His only Son into the world to die for me and to die for you and give us that opportunity. John, John only baptized with water. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet. We're talking about John, Isaiah. And Isaiah said this in chapter 40 of Isaiah. The one the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. For those of you that are familiar with the Old Testament and some of you that have been following in Proverbs, every time we see God speaking of straight paths and crooked paths, the wicked's path is crooked. The straight paths are those who follow the Lord. And we're talking about our hearts. Are you, my mom used to call it, on the straight and narrow? Are you on the straight and narrow? Which is funny, considering she's not a saved person. Are you on the straight and narrow? Are you doing what's right? For us, are we doing what God asks us to do? What is more important to you and I? The things of God are our own things. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locusts and honey. Second Kings chapter 1. That's how Elijah dressed. This is, this is the one like Elijah to come. And this is the last, essentially, of the Old Testament prophets. Up to this time, it's been 400 years since God has spoken to the people of Israel. And here comes John the Baptist, dressed in an unusual clothes. And I, I want you to see the power of God working here. This would be like us hearing about somebody 
down by the lake, and he's in a van, and he's preaching hellfire and brimstone, and somebody says, hey, have you heard, Gary, have you seen the guy that, that's dressed in sandals and like a beach bum? Let's go see him. He's obviously a prophet of God. We're talking about the number of people coming out to see John the Baptist. Some theologians think it's in the six figures. People from Jerusalem and all the area around are coming to repent and be baptized. There's such a crowd that here in verse 7, a little later on, we see what? John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism. He said to them, first, stop there. For those of you that aren't familiar with Pharisees and Sadducees, this would be the, the, the most common equivalent would be like the very far right Republicans and the far left Democrats coming together to agree something today. This is how different they are. The Pharisees were, were, were scriptural believing. They believed in the law. They broke it down into small parts. They even took it to such an extent that they added to the law to ensure they wouldn't break the law. The Sadducees would... would would follow only the first five books of the Old Testament. They would, they would follow that so they didn't believe in angels, they didn't believe in resurrection, they didn't believe in afterlife. But here they come together to see what's going on with John. And John looks at him, what's his response? You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance! And do not presume to say to yourself, We have Abraham as a father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. We talk about how repentance brings not just a change of mind, but a change of your life. That people can see the fruit of repentance in your life. The problem with the Sadducees and the problem with the Pharisees is they believe this. We were born Jews. We can take our bloodline and we can take our ancestry and we can look all the way back to Abraham. And you know what? They can point to the scriptures and they say, God is a God of promises and God does not lie. And God told Abraham that salvation would come to his people. But the amazing thing here, brothers and sisters, is how much they did not, did not read, or did not decide to take to themselves. We remember in Deuteronomy, what? If you have broken one point of the law, if you've sinned once, you have broken how much of the law? You have broken all the law. And you shall be judged by God. There is not one person who has ever lived than other than our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that has not sinned. It is He who came and, and took, again, the brunt of the judgment upon Himself. It is He that the prophets spoke of that were, was going to come, that was going to come to bring salvation to His people. In Isaiah 40, that, that chapter that, that points to John the Baptist as the one coming, He's also he's speaking of bringing salvation to his people. In Isaiah 40, it's God. Jesus. Who can tell me what Jesus' name means? God. Emmanuel is God with us. Jesus is God saves. It's a form of Joshua from the Old Testament. God saves. God himself comes to save his people. He came to save you and me. He came, and none of that, he's the one that comes not to baptize with water. John talks about him coming. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. I want you to realize how great John the Baptist is. Later on, Jesus says this of John the Baptist. Of all those born of women, John the Baptist is the greatest. What does John say? John says, of he who's coming, and he's speaking of Jesus, I am not worthy to carry his sandals. The greatest man, according to Jesus, that ever lived, isn't able to carry his sandals. 
which in the Jewish tradition, the only people that could do that were slaves, and they couldn't be Jewish, and they were the bottom of the rung. He wasn't able to, to, to serve Jesus, he said. He wasn't even able to do the dirtiest of jobs in, in their tradition. But Jesus who comes will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. We need to recognize this, that before anyone comes to God, that God has to draw us. That it is He that, that first off, in our sin, we want nothing to do with God. We may search for a God. We see it all the time, people making gods that, what, are pleasing to them. These gods will do what I want. Throughout history, God mocks the gods of stone. You, you, have made, you are worshiping things that man has made. Why? Because you're praying to it that it will bring you food. You are bring, praying to it that it will bring you prosperity. You are praying to it that it will bring you whatever your heart desires. But it will do nothing. It is stone. And stone has been created ultimately by the God Most High. Every single one, we search for God. Before I came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I, I did everything. I read books on Islam. I wrote, read books on Mormonism. I read books on witchcraft. I read books on astrology. I read books on numerology. But ultimately, what my search ultimately was for wasn't for God, as the universe proclaims him, but it was for a God who would please me and make me happy. It was for a God who I could open the morning paper and read my horoscope and he would tell me how good my day would be and how pleasing it would be to me. My search wasn't for a God who created all things. My search wasn't for a God who 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 watched over me. It wasn't for a God who held me in the palm of his hand. It wasn't for a God who brought me salvation, but was for a God who, dare I say it, was more like the genie in the bottle that I could make my wishes to, and he would fulfill them. But there came a time when people would pray for me, that they would tell me about Jesus, that they would plant seeds and water, unknowingly sometimes, seeds that were already planted. And God's Spirit opened my heart and showed me the sin that I had done, not just against the people around me, not just to the world around me, but against God Himself. And He opened and he poured into me the gift of faith that I would believe in Jesus. Not just as a man who died for me, but as God who died for me, who, who took, on, took on all my sin. The scriptures tell us that he became sin itself on the cross. And he took not just a little bit of the judgment upon him, but all the judgment that I deserve and all the judgment you deserve. And the amazing thing about that is that it takes an eternity for me to, to pay. And it takes an eternity for you to pay. Imagine the pain and the hurt for that wrath poured out upon him in a three-hour period and still that didn't kill him. He did it, and we're told the world went dark. There are re reports, ancient reports. In Egypt, they thought the world was ending because the world went dark. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Every, I think most of us remember that feeling. Kids, I'm sorry to break this to you, but there comes a time when you leave home and you know you can always go back, but you know it's never going to be the same. How many of us adults go, man, I wish I could go back to being a teenager again. I did not know how good my life was. 
some of us, I recognize, our lives weren't that good. But imagine being in the presence of the Father for all eternity. And then, in your hour, that it seems the most need, He separates completely from you. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then his last breath, telestai or telestoi, depending on which you read. In English, some of your translations say it is finished. It's complete. It's done. There's nothing more that you or I can do to add to the salvation. Jesus has done it all. Done everything that needed to be done. And all we have to do is recognize that He's our Lord and He's our King. And that means that we, we, we learn the Scriptures. Part of the Great Commission, go out baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, let us not forget this, teaching all that I have taught you, Jesus says. One of the questions that Jesus asked his disciples, he says, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? He is the one that comes. He comes and he baptizes with the Holy Spirit, that Spirit that draws us to the cross, the Spirit that opens our hearts. Not one of us have come to God that someone wasn't praying for you. But He also baptizes with fire. A fire unquenchable. You may be here today, and you may not, you may harden your heart. You may say, I want nothing to do with this God. I may not want to do with this Jesus, but you will be baptized one way or the other. You will either be baptized with a spirit or there will come a day and it's never too late until you take your last breath on this earth. And if you have not come to Jesus, you will be baptized by fire. You will be sent into the hellfires. It says this of Jesus, His winnowing fork is in His hand and He will clear the threshing floor, gather up the wheat into the barn, but the shaft will burn with unquenchable fire. Revelation puts it this way, that the smoke from their suffering goes on and on and on for eternity. But brothers and sisters, I'm telling you right now that He has not given up on you. You are here for a reason. If you do not claim Jesus as Lord and Savior, He is calling you now. Come to me. You might say, why, why should I come? At the end of chapter 3 says it, then Jesus came to Galilee, to Jordan, to John, to be baptized by him. It wasn't just off the top of his head, I think I'll go be baptized. That's a 70-mile trip. Jesus intentionally walked 70 miles. John looked at him, and it says John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? A baptism of repentance is saying I've sinned, that I need to be cleansed, I need to be forgiven. Jesus has never sinned. Why does he need to be baptized? John says, you, you baptize me. Jesus' response, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus, in Isaiah chapter 3, this is said to of him. The great chapter on the suffering servant, that he... He shall die for our sins. He shall die for our transgressions. That the Lord's wrath would pour out upon him. That he would be identified with the rebels. And this is Jesus identifying himself with you and me as sinners. He takes the first step of obedience, just as we've seen Claudia take on this day. And he takes that step of righteousness to do as God has commanded. And... When he says this to John, then John consented. And Jesus was baptized. Immediately he went up from the water. Notice he came out of the water. Nowhere, nowhere in Scripture do we say anything but baptism by immersion. 
He is completely put under the water. He is brought up. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and come to rest on him. We do not know if Jesus just saw this or if others saw this, but we know through the Holy Spirit and his uh, writing through Matthew that, that at least Jesus saw him. But then we do know that the crowd heard this, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. To be a Christian is to be identified so closely with the Christ that Jesus says this, that there will be those that persecute you, but fear not, for they didn't hate you, but they hated me first. To be so identified with Jesus that, that when we bring the message of Jesus Christ, when we preach Jesus Christ, that people will hate us and will persecute us, it is promised in Scripture. Amen. Amen. How odd to start a sentence that way. Jesus does it all the time. Truly, truly, it's coming. Is it not fortunate that at this moment in the United States, the biggest thing that we have is people charge our bakers and close down their shops and charge them great fees like $150,000 because they follow their beliefs. While yet in India, there are people being tracked down and killed at this very moment and hunted down. There will come a time when that is a worldwide thing. But we are so identified with the Son as Christians that God looks upon you and He sees not Lois in her sin, not Lois in her filth, not Claudia in all the things that she done and has done, not me in the hate and discontent that I had before I became a Christian, but He... <laughs> looks upon each and every single one of us as Christians and sees not us and our sin, but he sees his son, Jesus Christ, for he died and he bestows a righteousness upon us, a perfect righteousness. And he looks upon you and says, this is my child in whom I'm well pleased. The Father looks upon you. So I'd like to close with this. Christian, repentance isn't just a one-time thing, it's a daily thing, Scripture tells us in our life. God is continually opening up our sins that we have committed. I was just talking, thinking about it last week. Isn't it a miracle? Isn't it a great thing that God does not open us up to our entire list of sins that we have committed against Him at one time? Imagine Isaiah as he stands before the glory of God and he falls to his knees. I am a man of unclean lips. He's just thinking about his lips. But we are in a pattern of what we call sanctification. As God is leading us through our lives, and He's every day making us more and more into the image of His Son, and more and more opening our eyes to ways we have sinned against Him. The Pharisees would say this, We follow God's laws, we are perfect. The Apostle John would say this, He who says he is without sin is a liar. And God opens our eyes to those sins, and on a continuous basis, we repent. And for Claudia, I would ask that you would find a, a good church home if you haven't already found one. Where, where a pastor who has been given oversight over your soul would would walk with you and pray for you and love you as Jesus has loved you. That you would find a group of Christians who you could meet with on a, on a daily basis. Part of the way that the world will know us, Jesus says that they will know of you by the way that you love one another. And the book of Hebrews chapter 10 tells us not to neglect from assembling together. That we may encourage one another. 
And lastly, I am so happy to know that you've been reading your scriptures. Every word is breathed out by God. Every word given to us opens our eyes to sins that we never even thought of, encourages us on a daily basis, tells us how to keep strength. Ephesians 6 speaks to us of of putting on daily our armor of God so we may walk through this world without, without fear and without fear of falling. And more than this, it tells us of how God holds you in the palm of his hand and he will never let you go. He will never forsake you. He will never leave you. He will always hear you. Every Christian in this room will tell you that there there are times when, when God tells us no. But the one thing that we know is that God always has a perfect and right reason for what he does. And sometimes that no, we may not even know it. It may be, wait a little bit, Claudia. But he will never leave you. And lastly, I speak to anyone who may have not given their life to God, given their life to Jesus as Lord and Savior. I don't care if you've been baptized. I have talked to so many people in my life now that have been baptized when they were six or seven and haven't been into church for 25 years and haven't picked up their Bible. God doesn't care if you've been baptized in the water. A water baptism will not cleanse you of your sin. But it is the Holy Spirit and Jesus' blood and sacrifice alone that cleanses of our, of our sin. Water baptism is but a symbol of what has occurred in our hearts and in our lives. But if we would believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and Savior, and that He died for us. And we would confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. That salvation would come to us. And again, just as we spoke about of repentance earlier, when we believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, it will show in our life. And we will walk with God On a daily basis, we will run the race to completion and He will walk with us in its entirety and we shall live with Him for eternity. Not one of us knows the day nor the hour when we take our last breath on this world. I'm begging you now, if you have not done it, confess Him as Lord. This morning we saw Claudia baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what Scripture tells us when we meet together, that we meet not just with those in the room, but all those throughout Christian history that have confessed Jesus and God as Lord. So yes, Brother Mel was here this morning. That the angels, in fact, were here this morning that we stand worshiping God with all the believers, and that when one person comes to salvation, that the angels, the angels cheer. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you. For Claudia and their new heart that you have poured into her. And the obvious way changes in her life that we could see her love for you. I cannot help but thank you for the salvation that you have brought me. Having drawn me to the cross and saved me from the hellfire. Cannot help but thank you for every Christian in this room that that loves you and follows you. I pray that your word would not come void as back void as you have promised, that 
any in this room that have not given themselves to Jesus, that you would, in fact, draw them to the cross and open their hearts to their sin and our Lord and Savior and to his cross. I pray that this church would be a shining light, would shine brightly in a world of darkness. And I pray that we would be faithful in all things. And I give you all the glory. For if this church shines brightly and it is great, it is not because of anything I have done or said. It is not because of anything anyone else in this room has done or said. But it is because of everything you have done and said. We pray this in the heavenly name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen.